Most theologians today, whether historicists or futurists, are committed to the belief that the Beast of Revelation symbolically represents Rome, or at least a reunited Rome. For futurists, this tends to be because they see much of the Book of Revelation as being fulfilled around the year 70 AD, when Jerusalem was destroyed. And for futurists, the reasoning is a little more splintered, with some groups arguing that the number of the beast provides the necessary justification, this being due to some believing that the number 666 can be calculated to Nero Caesar, while others see a rebirthed Roman Empire as being the seat of the Antichrist, of which they believe the beast represents. Much of the above speculation regarding Rome as the beast tends to stem from complications of dealing with symbology in the Book of Revelation. I do have a lot of sympathy too for both sides of the eschatological divide in this regard, but with some careful interpretation of the symbols regarding the beast, I do believe that the truth will become clear. So to begin, the book of Revelation describes the beast as a hybrid-like creature that resembles a leopard, bear, and a lion. And each of these animals are actually located in the book of Daniel, where Daniel also sees, like the beast of Revelation, various beasts a lion, a bear, and a leopard arising out of the sea. The symmetry of these texts in the symbology is not coincidental, but what we see here is a uniformity between the symbology, and in this case, the book of Daniel provides some insight into exactly what these symbols refer to. In the book of Daniel, the symbols are explained too by the narrative that unfolds. The beasts correspond to the dream of the statue that Nebuchadnezzar has, there, Nebuchadnezzar is informed that his kingdom represents the gold head, that after him will come three other primary kingdoms as represented by the silver, bronze, and iron aspect of the statue. And then finally, the Iron Kingdom, at the end of its reign, will see a rock strike that statue on its feet, and the entire statue will come crumbling down. Upon which, the rock will become a great mountain that will cover the entire earth. In the same way, the four beasts of Daniel's own dream correspond to the same events found in the statue, with the final aspect of the fourth kingdom being the one defeated by Christ, the rock in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, with Christ and his people ruling over the entire earth afterward. And as the narrative of Daniel unfolds, the reader discovers that the statue, as represented in descending order, represents the kingdoms mentioned within the book of Daniel. These are Babylon, the head of gold, the silver being the Medes, the bronze being the Persians, and finally the kingdom of Greece is represented in the iron. These same aspects are also represented in the four beasts that arise from the sea, with the lion representing Babylon, the bear the Medes, the leopard the Persians, and the fourth beast is Greece. The corresponding nature of these symbols demonstrates that the Roman interpretation is not derived from scripture. Instead, it is often derived from outside sources or misunderstandings. The beast that arises from the sea in Revelation 13 is a conglomeration of the first three kingdoms mentioned in the book of Daniel. They are Babylon, the Medes, and Persia, or the lion, the leopard, and the bear. Now, an important part of the symbology found on the beast in the book of Revelation are the heads and horns, which the book of Revelation actually provides the interpretation for. As Revelation 17 states, The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Five have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, and now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The seven heads of the beast are hills or mountains, and they're also kings. And earlier, the book of Revelation describes horns and heads this way. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The head of the lamb is obviously Jesus. I don't think anyone would argue with that. And upon his head sit seven horns, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. This, as the context of this passage refers to, are the seven angels of the seven churches that are sent out to watch over the churches established by Christ and his apostles. They are the seven spirits before the throne mentioned in Revelation 1, which are also described as seven stars, a term often used of spiritual beings in the Bible. Revelation 1.4 states, 
John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Revelation 1.20 states, This is the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and of the golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And finally, Revelation 4.5 says, From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Before the throne burned seven torches of fire. These are the seven spirits of God. Horns, as the Bible makes clear in the book of Revelation, represent mighty princes or spiritual authorities that sit upon heads or spiritual kings. In the case of Jesus, he is the head, and the horns that sit upon him are the seven angels, or spirits, stars, or torches that do his bidding. In the same way, the heads of the beast are kings, but not human kings. They are spiritual kings, with the horns representing the spiritual princes that are subservient to them. And this explains why the beast can be summoned once more after thousands of years. The horns and the heads are spiritual beings that are eternal in nature, and the narrative of Daniel expresses the same idea in the chapters found at the end of his book. There, Daniel is given a vision of a goat that represents Greece, one of the kingdoms, with a large horn. And that goat, with that large horn, comes rushing out from the west and crashes into the ram of the east, defeating the ram and its horns. And as the book of Daniel then states, Daniel is visited by a mighty spiritual being and is informed of the following. On the twenty-fourth day of the first month, as I was standing on the bank of the great river, the Tigris, I lifted up my eyes, and behold, there was a certain man dressed in linen with a belt of fine gold from Euphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like the brilliance of lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of polished bronze, and his voice like the sound of a multitude. Do not be afraid, Daniel, he said. For from the first day that you purposed to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. However, the prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, for I had been left there with the kings of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the latter days, for the vision concerns those days. Do you know why I have come to you? He said. I must return at once to fight against the prince of Persia, and when I have gone forth, behold, the prince of Greece will come. But first I will tell you what is inscribed in the book of truth. Yet no one has the courage to support me against these, except Michael, your prince. Daniel's book confirms what the book of Revelation speaks of. Mainly that the Prince of Greece is that horn mentioned in Daniel 8 that sits upon the Grecian goat. He is the one that arrives and defeats the ram, obtains the kingdom, but has his kingdom split among four smaller horns. Here are the passages that demonstrate the parallel aspect of these verses. First, Daniel 8, 5-8 As I was contemplating all of this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between his eyes came out of the west crossing the surface of the entire earth without touching the ground. He came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and rushed at him with furious power. I saw him approach the ram in a rage against him, and he struck the ram and shattered his two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against him, and the goat threw him to the ground and trampled him, and no one could deliver the ram from his power. Thus, the goat became very great. But at the height of his power, his large horn was broken off, and four prominent horns came up in its place, pointing toward the four winds of heaven. Then Daniel 11, 2-4 Now then, I will tell you the truth. Three more kings will arise in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. By the power of his wealth, he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will arise, this is the prince or ruler mentioned earlier in Daniel 10, who will rule with great authority and do as he pleases. But as soon as he is established, his kingdom will be broken up and parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. 
It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the authority with which he ruled, because his kingdom will be uprooted and given to others. The kings or princes here, as represented by the heads and the horns, are spiritual authorities, not human rulers. And this is nowhere better exemplified by the mighty spiritual being that gives the message to Daniel in chapter 10. There, that mighty star states that he was himself opposed by the prince of Persia for 21 days, so that he was unable to deliver the message to Daniel, who now resides within the kingdom of Persia. Mighty beings like this one cannot be stopped by mere humans. So, whoever this prince mentioned here is, it is no mere human. This was spiritual warfare, and that is the primary theme found within the book of Daniel. As Paul too reminds us in the New Testament, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Coming back to our primary text now though, the beast mentioned in Revelation, being so similar to the dragon's own symbology, made up of heads and horns, it is surprising to me that so many see the beast as merely a human kingdom. All Bible commentators recognize that the dragon with its heads and horns represents Satan and the kingdom of the snake, obviously spiritual, with its own principalities and kings, but then suddenly believe that the very same symbology represents something entirely different when speaking of the beast. I believe that this form of selective hermeneutics is an incorrect method of interpretation, and not one scripture endorses itself. Symbology is consistent, and as such, the only way to interpret the beast consistently is to see it as similar to the dragon, and with all of the scriptural context in mind. And when this is done, it is easy to see that the beast is of three primary aspects, heads, horns, and body. The head represents the high kings, the mighty spiritual authorities. The horn represents the princes that are subordinate to the heads. And the bodies consist of both the spiritual hosts and the earthly kingdoms that these heads and horns rule over. The beast, then, is accurately translated as spiritual beings that once ruled over many nations who were historically defeated by other spiritual beings, and who now reside imprisoned and await their release. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe to this YouTube channel, please click the subscribe button below the video. There will be a part two to this video too, so stay tuned for that. And if you would like to look a little deeper on all things eschatology, check out my free book via the link in the description below.